Our final uh, speaker for the uh, first session this morning is Professor David Redmiles. And as I mentioned earlier, he is the third illustrious University of Colorado alumni. Thank All right, and speaking of alumni, I'm glad to see uh, at least three of my former students so uh, in the audience, and one of my current ones, and they will keep me honest. <laughs> so um, the last 10 years or so, I've been working on global software engineering, so looking at teams that are globally distributed and working on problems of, of software engineering. So today I want to talk just at a high level about some of that work a little bit of a review since the last forum where I gave a talk, and uh, some of the recent things that are somewhat different than that that I've uh, been working on recent, uh, the last couple of years. And then a big project that Debbie Broadbeck and I have been working on for the last year and a half at least is organizing the IEEE International Conference on Global Software Engineering. Uh, so that will be in this room uh, the first week of August. So I will spend a lot of time telling you about what's going on in that conference and how it uh, tries to connect industry and uh, academic, academic research. Okay, so starting with uh, some reflections on my own work, a lot of you who might have been at the last forum a couple of years ago, uh, you know, I've been looking at these teams that are working across different uh, countries. Sometimes it's in-house, sometimes it's outsourcing. And the problems that occur with the teams. So these are not turning out, turn out not to be just technical problems with sharing software, but they um, turn out to also be social problems. People working in isolation, not knowing what others are doing, or having a lack of awareness or knowing why someone is doing one thing or not doing something. And distance in general and separation prevents familiarity with the other team members or the other teams that you might be working with. And that's both professional as well as personal. So <coughs> for a number of years we did a research and there's a paper reference at the bottom here with my uh, former student Clayson de Souza, who did three or four field studies with uh, government agencies and uh, industry to look at how people were managing this issue of distance and separation. And basically there was a lot of manual work that had to be done. So when you're working with other people, I mean one way to look at it is with uh, you're monitoring other people, but you have to also display your actions to others as well. You have to do some actual work in order to keep people aware of what uh, what you're doing and some actual work to find out what they're doing. So we found out that, that there were a lot of manual uh, work being done, uh, people reading uh, email lists, uh, people chatting with one another, uh, even people setting up simple databases to keep track of who was working on what bits of a project. So there's a lot of ad hoc uh, tools and a lot of ad hoc work that was going on just to make uh, work more visible and to keep track of what other people were doing. So you can imagine that there was a lot of uh, uh, confusion uh, w with that and of course a lot of uh, needless work. So we took a tool base uh, approach and built uh, a number of different tools to try to alleviate the issues of distance. Now again, some of these I've talked about in the past and I always like to refer to other papers that you can read more details about and the slides will be online. Uh, but in the upper left, uh, we developed a tool just to so show the social network around code that was being developed. Uh, we tried a more condensed visualization, a more abstract visualization on the right showing the dependencies. And then for a few years, Andre Vanderhoek and I were working together and we looked at other kinds of visualizations, such as this map face uh, visualization to show where dependencies were between groups. And then we started looking more and more at 
personal dimensions such as how do I feel about the person I'm working with when they don't answer my email? Now, when you, you don't get a response or something that you don't expect or you were expecting doesn't happen, uh, then you start to make up a reason in your mind, you know, why did that happen or not? Uh, so it depends a lot on your personality and your past experience, whether you attribute the uh, failure of the expectation to some negative uh, reason, like the person is just ignoring me, or you attribute it to something more generous, like, oh, I know they're working on a lot of projects. So much more recently, we looked at software tools that have different kinds of gauges you can see in this, uh, well, you can see at the high level, uh, in this visualization on the lower right, a dashboard that talks about the activity that someone else is doing. So that kind of tool helps you create a more positive attribution of why someone is uh, meeting the expectation or not. Uh, so that catches us up to a few years ago when we were building a lot of tools. But we wanted to go further in understanding trust in distributed organizations. And so I had a student who graduated just last year, Oliver Wong, who's now working at IBM Almaden. And we started looking at how to model what's going on at a larger scale among different people in uh, different teams and organizations. And so uh, taking a cue from game theory and working with a professor in the uh, philosophy department here, Brian Skirms, uh, we started to develop game th uh, theory models of how people interact. And in that, and, uh, in that uh, area, you can imagine that, well, working together on a software team is like going on a hunt. And we use this uh, figure from uh, ancient stag hunt, where uh, you see it uh, can be approximated by a cooperate or a defect kind of activity. So do I choose to cooperate with you, or do I choose to continue to work on my own? Do I have a positive affect towards you, and therefore will cooperate? Or do I have a negative affect that maybe would not cooperate? So using the models, and again, here's a nice reference. Uh, we just published on this modeling approach and on Oliver's dissertation, uh, we were able to model the spread of cooperation and find a parallel between the way people interacted over chat with the way they cooperated in uh, the software development activity. So when there was uh, chat about familiar or personal things, often there was more cooperation around the work items. Now this may or may not surprise you. I mean, I think a lot of us are chatting, or at least I am, throughout the day in a more personal way with people I, I also work with. Uh, but a lot, of, a lot of managers in the workplace we found were treating uh, the kind of chatter that did not have directly to do with work as kind of a negative thing, don't waste time. But what we were finding in our studies and in the modeling work uh, that matched a couple of uh, open source and open projects we could data mine, we found that this personal chat or this non-work related chat, which we uh, termed cheap talk, actually improved the cooperation. So if you uh, find this paper, uh, you'll find in their results that uh, uh, the, the chat and the trust and the cooperation could be contagiously spread over time. So got more and more interested in the personal dimension and how much that was actually affecting technical work. And so my student has a poster and it is sitting in the back uh, right now, uh, but has a poster uh, during that session, Mu Miao Zhao. Uh, we are taking, she took, uh, took an approach where people were just allowed to draw together. And we are just uh, getting uh, maybe a quarter or a third through this project. And we just, but we did run an experiment with 72 people uh, divided up into teams of three. And half of those teams were given a directed drawing, a task, uh, which is drawing Brent Hall. And others were allowed to do freeform drawing, which uh, you see this uh, uh, at the bottom. And, uh, 
these are actually pictures that were done during the study. Uh, so we have some people that are really good at drawing Brent Hall. Uh, so, um, well, we found that both in both cases, and I'll get correct if I'm wrong, but in both cases, uh, the positive affect towards the team improved, and that also improved the team cohesion. But in the case where they were allowed to freely <coughs> express themselves and play in the drawing, uh, the uh, positive effect and the cohesion improved more. Okay, I saw a nod, so that was uh, approximately correct. And Meng Yao can um, uh, explain more about when, uh, if you visit her at her poster. Uh, so we are analyzing the data from the uh, teams of three that we did, uh, that uh, she did the study on. Uh, there's a, a previous paper that's more like a white paper on this area of art-mediated self-expression in the workplace and how that can help with spreading trust and cooperation. Uh, and that reference is here. So over the last 10 years, a uh, thing that has surprised me is that collaboration, cooperation around software development is not just about the technical sharing or the uh, platform you might be developing in, but it has a lot to do with the personal dimension and maintaining and enhancing that. And so we've still looked at software tools and other kinds of approaches, but approaches that could enhance or engender the kind of trust and positive effect you could have to improve the work or the quality of the work. Again, you're getting a taste or an overview of a lot of things. So here comes the plug. And if you're on the ISR mailing list, you must have already been bombarded by emails about this. But uh, this has been a lot of work. And uh, Debbie and I are very proud. And uh, she's holding up a poster right now, um, <laughs> or a flyer for the advanced program. They're on the table outside. But in case you're like me and don't like to read but hear things told to you, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the conference. And I think it's a particularly appropriate topic to talk about here in the forum because this conference has always sought to balance industry participation with academic research. And we've done that by having on the organizing committee, if you look at the web, a mix like the program chairs, there's one from academia, one from research, um, and the same goes throughout. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Roberto Silva Fijo, who is sitting in the back, and, and I'm glad to see today, he uh, is from GE right now, and he was one of the tutorials uh, co-chairs. So um, the conference has always sought to bring this balance, and uh, it's sponsored on the auspices of the IEEE Computer Society. Uh, a longtime supporter has been Siemens uh, from Bangalore, uh, this year we also have Microsoft uh, supporting us, uh, of course the Institute for Software Research and, um, uh, and the uh, Donald Brand School. And we, Debbie and I are quite happy to add your company to this list of supporters <laughs> and we'll be around all day to uh, talk about that. Um, but very happy if you would come. There's a one day registration. There's a whole, uh, full conference registration, <laughs> early bird registrations by June 30th. And what's interesting also about this conference is the registration includes the tutorials and the workshops. So besides bringing industry and academia together, the conference, oh, this is slightly faded, sorry. Um, but the conference has moved around the world. Last year it was in Spain, the south of Madrid, in a small city. Uh, before that, in Shanghai before that in Bari in Italy, before that in Porto Alegre. Uh, why so many different places? Well, uh, some of you may already know, like uh, in Brazil, there's a lot of uh, outsourced software development and a lot of companies that are split. So it's still internal to the company, but they have a lot of um, uh, uh, software development going on in Brazil. Uh, similarly, some of these other companies uh, uh, countries are hosting a lot of uh, software development firms that work internationally. And I'll uh, speed up just a little bit. Uh, we have three great keynotes, again, mixing academic and um, industry work. Uh, the first keynote, so our kickoff keynote, will be uh, by uh, uh, Priya Vijaya Rajadan, 
who is working at SAP in uh, Palo Alto and working on uh, building uh, entrepreneurship both within and without uh, the com uh, companies. Uh, Peggy's story, some of you heard, is the ISR speaker. This is a whole new talk she's going to give about uh, bots and collaboration. And I just got a little taste at ICSI of a preview of the talk Andy Bagel was going to give where he's looking at biometric uh, feedback to improve programmer performance. And he usually brings a lot of biometric monitoring tools when he gives his talk. Uh, so that's, uh, that's really kind of fun. So he'll be on the Friday of that week. Uh, so it's a very new and uh, interesting area. And the biometrics also touch affect but at a more basic level uh, versus the rational level that I was, more, more rationalistic level I was talking about earlier. We have tutorials, I'll just highlight one because Walt Scoffey's sitting there. Uh, he's going to do a tutorial on open source software development for uh, GSD, which he is expert on. Uh, but we have uh, uh, tutorials on uh, cultural issues as well as a big topic in the conference and in the community this year is scaling agile uh, techniques to work globally. And I'm sure a lot of you have um, thought about that yourselves. Uh, there's two workshops also included. Uh, new this, uh, the workshop on modeling, Paris. A workshop new this year on educating for the global uh, workplace. Uh, there's a doctoral symposium as well. And these are the session titles that we have just come up with uh, last week, but there's things that focus on collaboration and crowdsourcing, on teamwork, on improving process and agile methods, architecture, and then a whole session where people are talking about different models or taxonomies. <coughs> and really quickly, I went through to look at the different institutions, both academic and industry, that uh, are represented by the authors who are coming, Siemens in Bangalore, I mentioned already, but also Accenture in India, uh, industrial uh, facility in Norway called Sintep. So you see, uh, a lot, and a lot of universities around the world, including the U.S. Irvine has always been in there, but this year, since I'm organizing it, I can't submit. So, um, so I will wind down by saying uh, about the conference: early bird registration on the 30th, and there's still opportunities for sponsorship. So, see you in August. Thank you.